Welcome to the hit show, The Brilliance Ultimatum. Time's up. We have the power. We have the resources. We have the knowledge. We have the intellect. We have the innovation and we have the heart to create a world based on parity, practical innovation, and potential. This hit show with Claudette Rowley will take us on a journey so we can explore our planet, our global community, and our opportunity for transformation. We need a cultural revolution that allows us to look past political squabbles, lack of humanity, and to what she calls reality resistance. So tune in. This is the Brilliance Ultimatum. And time's up. Hey, everybody. I'm Claudette Rowley, and you are listening to the Brilliance Ultimatum. Time's up on Transformation Talk Radio. Stay with us for the next hour and let us help you experience what's going well in the world and the opportunity for transformation that's upon us. On the second and fourth Fridays of each month, we have some of the foremost change makers, action takers, and truth tellers helping you re-envision what's possible on our planet and in our world. I am really excited about today's guest, um, who is Shannon Atkins, and she is the CEO of a company called Future State. And I am really excited to learn more about Future State because it sounds like they're doing some really cool work, innovative work. So Shannon is committed to living and working at the intersection where colossal business success meets passion, purpose, and meeting. She spent 15 years driving internal innovation and seeding and developing external collaborations for major global companies, including Wells Fargo, Intuit, and Odesk. Shannon returned to Future State, one of the first places she worked after college, because it was where she felt most able to contribute her full self, something that became a top priority after she became a parent. She is an expert facilitator known for supporting and aligning teams as they develop and implement innovative strategies and is quick to understand the complexities of any business and identify tangible opportunities for value creation. Shannon's ability to connect the dots and make sense of seemingly unrelated factors helps her identify creative solutions that solve for more than just profitability, but also help build deep and strong cultures that value the integrity of people, communities, and the planet. Well, that is music to my ears. Welcome, Shannon. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm really happy to have you here. Looking forward to this. So um, I think the place to start is tell us about Future State. What does Future State do? Uh, great question. We are a management consulting company. Um, and at times our clients say, are you really? Is that what you are? Um, because I think, you know, if you know a little bit about the history of management consulting, one of the core premises of management consulting is that there are experts in the world and they know all the things, and if you make sure to grab them and bring them into your organization, you'll have a competitive advantage because they're the smartest people in the room. And uh, Future State's point of view is a bit different. We we actually believe that the most in, you know influential and effective insights and the wisdom of any given organization um, are going to be most served by uh, tapping into the wisdom of the folks within that organization, the stakeholders you serve, your customers, and your community. And we think of ourselves as more facilitators and co-creators of that future state with our client. Um, but if you find a box, management consulting is the one we fit into most, most, uh, most easily. <laughs> so while we, while we are management consultants, we're also really open to transforming the world of management consulting and what it means and how, to, how we engage with with both our clients, our community, and, and our team members. Yeah, and I, I enjoyed reading your website. And I noticed there's something really interesting you do with your clients, right? It's fresh and innovative. And I have a very, you know, I, I do consulting in management consulting, you know, and cultural consulting, et cetera, and have a very similar approach in the sense that I'm always a partner. So I completely understand what you're, you're talking about, right? I'm not coming in as an expert. So we're, you know, we're kind of, we're seeing what needs to be revealed. But it also looks like you have done some really um, phenomenal work with the internal culture of your company. That's, oh, that's yeah. what the website is. And that's what I get from the website. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It yeah. definitely um, leans towards the recruiting and sort of come be a part of us um, storyline on our website for sure, which is uh, intentional. I think, you know, many of the people that work for our organization, I would say everybody that works for our organization has selected to not be a road warrior um, you know, only focused on advancing through the ranks of a consulting firm up to the level of partner, sacrificing, you know, what many of our, many of our peers have had to sacrifice on that journey. Mm -hmm. So a common thread with future state team members is folks who are committed to living 
a whole life um, mm -hmm. and, and contributing in society, contributing to their families, being uh, connected to their passions and their their work equally. Uh, so it, in the past, you know, our company is almost 40 years old. That did attract women, uh, primarily women, right, who had found themselves unable to have that same freedom and autonomy in in corporate America. I hope that's changing. Um, at, but for our organization, it does mean that we're, you know, 100% employee owned and of our employee owners, 87% of our owners are women. And we are 100% women led. So our C-suite and board are all women. And, uh, and we really do, you know, sort of say, yes, it's a great place for women. It's actually a great place for anyone who's committed to <laughs> living a full, well-rounded, you know, integrated life. Um, so that, that's something unique and different about Future State, I think. Um, I hope less and less unique as, as the years and days go on. Definitely, absolutely. Um, and what, how do you describe the culture of Future State? Uh, a little scrappy. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm actually gonna, I, I hope I'll be, uh, effective in leveraging my first bit of executive administrative support uh, coming here in the next couple of weeks. So, but our organization is very kind of all in, everybody gets together in service of our clients and in service of our internal organizational priorities. So highly co-created collaborative environment, not a lot of status, not a lot of hierarchy, um, really committed to folks being able to lean into the work that is inspiring to them, grow and develop, and uh, and build capability. I know for myself, I certainly don't think I was qualified to be the CEO when I took on the role. Um, and I know it's our COO feels the same. So our, and really the woman who founded this company gave all of us so many chances to do things that we were wildly underqualified for. So I think there continues to be a threat of you're ambitious, you're smart, you're connected, you're creative. Let's see what you can do um, mm -hmm. that, we, that we value and, and wanna continue to, to open up for team members. Yeah, and I know I just that reminded me. I noticed on your website something about, and I'm not looking at it now, so I'm paraphrasing certainly. But this idea that you're not necessarily always looking for people to have exactly the right educational experience, for example, to match the role. You talk about ambitious, smart, right? People who have the right mindset, who, who yeah. really want to get involved. Yeah, so it's right. a very different way of recruiting. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I don't actually know the college degrees that folks in my organization have. Um, and I'm an English major from UC Santa Barbara, so that certainly doesn't meet the, uh, <laughs> right. I'm an English major too. English major as consultants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah but totally I think, get it. You know, we, we figure what, what's common is that curiosity, mm -hmm. that commitment to impact, um, with future state, a, a large strain of practicality. Um, so folks who are really committed to impact, but not going through the motions, right? What's going to have that effective impact right now? Let's do that right next thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so one final question about Future State itself, um, is we're, we're going to move on to some other really interesting topics, but why, why is the company called Future State? Um, we help our organizations that we serve move through their current challenges, opportunities, and risks to arrive at their future state. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for us, it's really about ensuring that every single effort that a client is embarking upon, which is usually called a transformation or change effort, um, that first and foremost, the thing that we're all anchoring to is, is the why. So the purpose mm -hmm. for that transformation, and then secondarily, the who. Who are the people that are coming on this journey and what do we need to ensure that they can move through this transformation effectively and empowered and, and engaged um, so that those are really at the core of everything we do whether it's a process transformation or a technology transformation or a operating model transformation we start with why and and how are we going to bring those folks along that sounds great yeah thank you for that so what what is the favorite part what's your favorite part of your job um, I, this is, uh, maybe this is common for CEOs, maybe not. I love, I love meeting new clients and pitching, you know, and, and introducing them to our team and helping them see what's possible in collaboration and, and partnership. I still spend a pretty significant part of my day and my week in client facing um, meetings and in conversations with folks who are considering bringing Future State on as a partner. I mm -hmm. love that. Um, and then when we find a client that is truly committed to transforming how they work and you see that commitment all the way up to the C-suite, that's absolutely the place that we, um, I get fired up from working with clients directly. 
Oh, okay. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of that client facing, right? You're bringing it to life for people. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. And I get that opportunity to then see what's resonating in our, in our story, in our offering, in how we're approaching the work, what is really differentiated, what's really standing out for our clients. So even the clients that I don't work with directly, I do conduct that, you know, post conversation with them to say what worked, what didn't work, how do we improve? How can we do better? Every single client gets that, you know, one-on-one conversation with me to make sure we're, we're continuously improving and learning and growing. Sounds good. Wow. That's great. So what 21st, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Yeah. 21st century leadership skills, right? That of course is so important, isn't it right now? I mean, I just think we look, I look around the world and we just see this incredible need for leaders, like true leadership, I think of all kinds. Absolutely. What are you seeing? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Oh man, <laughs> made me a little sad there for a moment. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> opportunity too, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I think that, you know, the number one thing that's emerging for me is self-awareness and yeah. authenticity. And, and I think for, I'm 47 years old. I think for a lot of folks who came up in their career at the same time that I did, or even a little ahead of me, you know, we had a particular br- blueprint for what it meant to be successful. And for many of us, it wasn't it didn't feel right and it didn't necessarily feel good, but it was, it it seemed it was something like, have a lot of expertise, have all the answers, make sure that everybody knows you have all the answers, manage up (laughs) and you will be rewarded with a large team of people who report to you and financial responsibility for a large P&L. And I think now we're seeing that as the world becomes so much more dynamic and changes so much more both, you know, sort of frequent and intense, for any business, any corporation, any community, any government, um, those those truths aren't holding true so much anymore. And really what's becoming most important is, can I adapt? Can I um, gather information and review data to arrive at new insights? Do I have an experimental mindset? Am I self-aware and able to see my own strengths, but also my, my opportunities for growth and be transparent with others about that? so that I can bring forth that same self-awareness and transparency from others. And we can collectively rise to challenges with unknown answers. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is such a rich and important topic. I want to take a quick break and then come back in and dive into it. So you are listening to the Brilliance Ultimatum. Time's up with Claudette Rowley. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Inspire. Create. Empower. Only on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Heaven on Earth, your online school of divinity, building your inner coach as you lay down your foundation in the new earth with you as the authority. Take action now. The number one challenge people face every day is the negative voice in their head. We work each day to turn negatives into positives. It's all a matter of perception. Our challenge at this time is to remain intensely positive and focused, creating the world we wish to live in. Wake up on purpose with Cornelia's daily online positive messages guiding us in the new paradigm. Raise yourself into happiness and inner peace daily. Elevate your personal frequency, free from negativity, and reprogram yourself step by step, shifting your energy patterns with positive repetition, daily building your new earth with someone you trust. All the heavy lifting has been done for you. Wake up happy with Cornelia Stephanie, BIP.com. Try free for seven days now. Are you ready to put down that drink or drug for good? Are you struggling to maintain your recovery from addictive behaviors? Do you need help with a family member or loved one who's in early recovery or battling addiction? Get the help and guidance you need by arranging a recovery recharged phone session with me, Ellen Stewart, Pushy Broad from the Bronx, Certified Life and Recovery Coach. Call 1-800-889-1757. Make an appointment today. Or go to my website, pushybroadfromthebronx.com, and click on the link that says Recovery Recharged. Don't wait. Get the help you need today. This is Ellen Stewart, Pushy Broad from the Bronx, on TransformationTalkRadio.com. 
We're back on the Brilliance Ultimatum. I'm Claudette Rowley. And for those of you just joining us, my guest today is Shannon Atkins, who is the CEO of Future State. And we are talking about this idea of outrageous futures and, and how organizations and all of us as people can move from where we are to a really incredible future state. So right before we went to break, um, Shannon, we were, I just asked you about you know, leadership skills, right? 21st century leadership skills. And you were talking about authenticity and self-awareness, which I agree are critically important. And I think there's, my observation has been um, that there's a shift somehow in this need, I think for a long time, and I'm, you mentioned you're 47, I'm 50, so we're about the same age. And to me, it, it, it seems like when I first got interested in leadership in my 20s um, and learning about it and studying it, right, self-awareness wasn't really even coming up that much in the literature or in what people discussed. And now we see it re really like all the time in coaching, right? This leader needs more self-awareness. There's this, the person has blind spots. And why do you think this, this emergence, this need for self-awareness has really come to the forefront? I, I think it goes to the fact that the world is, I think that buka expression, though, though it's a bit overused, you know, volatile, uncertain, you know, what complex, what's the A stand for? Can't even remember now. But <laughs> yeah, I'm blanking on it all, so, but I know what you mean. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that, that level of uncertainty uh. that we're all operating inside of, you know, the credibility of saying, I have the answer. I know the answer. Just listen to me. It's, it's way lower now than mm -hmm. it was even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, because um, the businesses that are thriving in the 21st century are the businesses that are constantly experimenting and willing to throw out the things that aren't working with velocity um, mm -hmm. and test something new. So as a leader, if I'm not also constantly growing, then I'm not going to be keeping pace with my business. So if I'm constantly growing, then obviously there are places that I need to grow that I can't yet see fully. Right? And I need someone else to tell me, mm -hmm. hey, did you know you have a blind spot that you, gosh, you always have to be the expert in the room. And that shuts other people down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, um, I noticed that when you are under stress, you um, can find yourself unwilling to uh, pause, reflect, and do a retrospective to see what's working. Whatever it might be. And, and opening that up, that we as leaders can get that and also our team members can get that. Um, I think is really, you know, incredibly important in the 20th century. Yeah, there's that, like you said, that like credibility of like, I have the answer, I'm the expert, right? Moving to something else. Like, how do I, how do I navigate, right? How do I feel my way through something? Those are some of the and, things that I think about. Yeah, and bring yeah. out the best in others, knowing yeah. I cannot possibly know everything. Even if I spent mm -hmm. six hours a day studying and learning, I wouldn't know everything. So how do I, you know, make sure that I'm bringing in that diversity of perspective, that diversity of thought, making sure that people know it's safe to be vulnerable by role modeling that behavior. What's, I'm curious, what's been one of your, and I know I'm putting you on the spot asking this, um, but what's been one of your greatest leadership lessons? Like, you know, whether it was a mentor, an experience you had, you know, anything like that. The one that always comes to mind is uh, mm -hmm. the woman who founded Future State is a woman named Meryl Natchez. And her confidence in my ability certainly sustained me early in my career, gave me, gave me footing that I, I certainly wouldn't have had otherwise. But one of the things that she taught me was you must ask for feedback every single time we interact, every single time you interact with a peer, every single time you interact with an employee, someone that reports to you, you need to ask, what did I get right? How can I improve? And you need to do that with velocity and intentionality. And if you do, you will grow faster than your peers. And mm. that was early in my career, just really normalizing the process of getting and giving feedback. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think she was right. I think that a lot of my success came from, you know, really being hungry for that perspective and point of view, knowing that I could integrate all, some or none, if it didn't really resonate with me, but making that a good thing to get feedback about what's working and not working about. My that is brilliant. My impact. Right? Wow. To really sharpen, sharpen that saw, right? I'm just going to ask for feedback over and over again. What did yeah. I do right? How can I improve? Yep. Um, it's yeah, so simple, it's, but it's so unusual. <laughs> it is. Well, because it can be really, for some people, it's painful, right? Initially, for them to get that constructive feedback. Um, and I, I'm doing some work with the CEO right now, and she loves feedback also. 
Like she actually wants, especially constructive, like how can I improve? How can I do better? Like she asks her team members all the time for this feedback and they, they share it with her. <laughs> they're, they're, they're very upfront with her, right? Because she, she's open to it and really wants it, like you said. And that creates a space in her environment, I'm sure, where people who aren't doing that <laughs> stand out, right? People who are stand unwilling right. to ask for feedback or integrate feedback stand out as maybe not quite the right culture fit for this place. Um, and I, I think that's the culture you want to create is one where uh, we are all collectively rising together and can, committed to contributing to one another's success, recognizing that we're all human and we're all growing and we're all evolving. I remember year, years ago when I was, uh, almost 20 years ago when I was in coaching training, uh, coaching certification training, and you know, the, one of the instructors said something that changed, um, was life changing for me. And she said to the room, this wasn't to me, but to the whole training class, she said, you know, feedback is not truth. And I was like, oh my gosh, wow. Like I never thought of it that, right? If feedback isn't truth, like you said, you get to pick and choose what resonates with you, what makes the most sense to you. Um, and I think that that is a key piece at least for me, and being able to, to really embrace feedback, right? Knowing that I have a choice. And I was just curious what your, your thoughts are on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say when I became CEO, something got a little bit more complicated in, in the getting and giving feedback, um, which, has, which is still a surprise to me. I'm five years into the role of CEO. Um, and early on, we had a complex challenge in our business. We couldn't we didn't know exactly which way to pivot, but we knew we needed to pivot. Yeah. And I shared that with the team authentically, right? I don't know exactly where we need to go. What do you think? And mm -hmm. it was very disorienting for my team. They were still looking for that command and control, hierarchical, the, the boss has all the answers, um, domain of expertise driven leadership it really uh -huh. disoriented people on my team for a while <laughs> i think we're now through it i think now five years in people are like oh yeah she does that all the time it doesn't mean she's lost it doesn't mean she doesn't have a plan it means she's testing and probing and trying to determine what might be the best next move um, but I, I do find there there is increasing complexity um, in hierarchical mindsets uh, that are still here today in the 21st century they're not gone uh, to getting and giving that feedback. So when I want to give feedback to folks, I do have to make sure they know, hey, at this moment in time, I'm not acting as your CEO and telling you, you must take this feedback and integrate it. I'm offering a perspective. It's something for you to consider and being a bit more diligent about recognizing my positional power uh, mm -hmm. and the impact that that can have on people un uh, you know, unintentionally. Absolutely. And I think that's a really, I mean, two key points I want to read or, you know, just kind of want to underscore. One is, when, and I've had this experience too, where you, when, when it, an organization and a culture is used to more of the command and control, right? I'm going to direct you and then you give them this freedom. It can be disorienting, yeah. right? What do you mean? You know, and I think we, I know for me early on in my career, I thought, oh, wasn't that a great thing just to give people all this freedom? Well, yeah. it is, but they, you know, they have to get used to it. They have to understand what they can do within it, right? Yep. Um, what skills they need. And I think that that's, that is a really key point and also positional power for sure. Right. Like what, and, and the CEO was mentioning, she ran into that too, was interesting where she got feedback where people were like, you know, when you do these, you know, skip level meetings and meet with other people in the organization, if you make a suggestion, they think they have to do it. <laughs> yeah. She's like, Oh, I was just really making a suggestion. Well, yep. you need to say that. <laughs> yep. so, yeah. You really do. So that, that yeah. as a leader, really slowing down and letting, letting people know your intention, the context, your process, who you are, how you lead, mm -hmm. how it might be different for them. I, that's been a big lesson for me about how, what it means to be transparent isn't just saying what I'm thinking in the moment. In fact, that's not the kind of transparency people are looking for. <laughs> it's how did I arrive at that decision? What is my thinking process? How did I gather input? Where am I going next? That's the focus. that's what people are really looking for. Definitely, definitely. So when we talk about the heart of organizational transformation, mm -hmm. and just authenticity and self awareness, which I think is important for everybody, right? Not just leaders. Um, what what else have you seen is really critically important? Yeah. Um, so one of one of the things you're and now we're shifting to sort of not just future state but the organizations that we serve and right and in our work as organizational transformation experts we have had the opportunity to observe a lot of organizations large small 
all industries, and there do tend to be a couple of core attributes that seem to matter a lot uh, in the midst of transformation. And that first one we touched on early in our conversation around purpose. Yeah. So why it has to, you know, and I'll get a little bit on my soapbox. It can't just be shareholder return or profit. Or oh, no. It has to be beyond um, the traditional financial metrics. It has to resonate, you know, in people's hearts and in their minds. And then the second we talked about a bit too, right? It needs to be, you need to engage all stakeholders. What usually happens on a transformation initiative is that the senior executives are way bought in at the beginning and then their participation dwindles and the front line is not a part of the conversation at the beginning. And then we expect them to adopt with glory and glee. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. Transformations. And what we really stand for is that integration being more connected throughout um, the transformation journey. Definitely right. And a common mistake I've seen leadership teams make also, right? We're completely into this. What, why, aren't, why isn't everyone else just on board? Yep. Yeah. One of the observations I had is leaders do tend to be talking to me about wanting to push decision making down, wanting mm -hmm. more autonomy and freedom, giving teams more power. And then they are also frustrated with they aren't making the right decisions. I don't understand why they don't have the insight, the knowledge, the wisdom that I have to make the decisions that they need to make. Right. And it's, <laughs> we, we forget that the position we're in is by default one that allows us to see across and through. So creating that end-to-end -end visibility takes time and concentrated mm -hmm. effort uh, to level up those teams. Absolutely. I mean, I think that make, that's a really key point, right? Vantage point matters, context matters, and you, you know, you can only see what you can see. And so how do we teach people to go to look differently, have different perspectives and go find different information, right? And data that's um, right. and what's in front of them. So such an, it's such a practical and yet incredibly important, um, incredibly important point. So we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to move in, we're going to shift gears slightly and talk about something I'm fascinated with, which is how do we start rewiring organizations to be more adaptable? This is Claudette Rowley. You are listening to The Brilliance Ultimatum. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Hi, this is Kimberly Carlson, and I would love for you to tune in to All In Healing Radio, where together we will begin to experience health, happiness, and harmony in all areas and aspects of life. Join us every first Tuesday of the month at 11 a.m. on TransformationTalkRadio.com. All in Healing will help you release layers of negative beliefs and energies for radiant health, deep joy, and greater abundance. Visit me at KimberlyCarlson.com. How many times do you find yourself saying, it was nothing, or just doing my job, when really you knocked it out of the park? How did you get like this? Next time someone tells you great job, you'll know how to accept it and not deflect it by listening to Courage to be Seen Radio with host Sherry Clark. Sherry Clark is an experienced global engineering leader, coach, and mentor. From her experiences one-on-one -on -one coaching to corporate consulting and executive coaching, Sherry has learned many women need at least three things to discover and face success. Learn about the ACES program, how to survive male-dominated fields with grace and authenticity, and reach the top without ever once giving up on who you are. Courage to be Seen host Sherry Clark explores the awesome power of your entire self and how far you can go by being more you. Check out her website, CourageToBeSeen.com. You have the courage to be seen. See you later. It's time to shake out your money-making truth on Soul Wisdom Abundance with Jennifer Bloom, creating wealth from spiritual health on TransformationTalkRadio.com. This hit show is more than your roadmap to success. It's your compass to abundance through joy and ease. Jennifer Bloom teaches you about the soul's relationship to money and wealth and how improving that relationship serves both you and the world. Learn more at JenniferBloom.com. Your eternal purpose is calling out to you each and every day. Are you listening? Tune in to Dynamic Destiny Radio with Coach Pete Cafarcio every first and third Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Learn to be your authentic self and live the life that you were destined for. Learn practical tools to discover your purpose and conquer other fears that keep you stuck in a life of mediocrity. 
Learn more about Coach Pete by visiting PeteCoaching.com. Are you ready to transform your life and embrace magical experiences? Talking to Tannis with your host, Tannis McRae, is here to help you find your joy in life. Tune in live every first and third Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Let's awaken your experience and create the change necessary to take back your right to choose who you are. For more about Tannis, visit TalkingToTannis.com. Back on the Brilliance Ultimatum, I'm Claudette Rowley here with my guest today, Shannon Atkins, who is the CEO of Future State. So, Shannon, before we jump in to talk about adaptability, um, folks, listeners who want to find out more about you and more about your company, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, futurestate.com is our website, and we've got some thought leadership pieces there, including a recent article that we worked on with the Harvard Business Review about our perspective on connected organizations, which is a great a great place to kind of get a sense for a lot of the topics we're talking about today. And then I'm a LinkedIn nut. I love it. <laughs> so I think it does its job so well. Um, and so it's Shannon Adkins with a D, um, and I'm more than happy to connect with folks there directly. Um, and uh, and continue the dialogue. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. So, so we, yeah, so rewiring modern organizations, organizations for adaptability. So what do we really mean by that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, we started to talk about one of the, one of the things that we know is really important, which is mm -hmm. an end-to-end -end visibility. Um, mm -hmm. Organizations that invest in providing structures and um, mechanisms for people to understand the whole as well mm -hmm. as their part in the whole. So we use the word integrate, but we really mean more like in integrity, right? But there right. is a level of attention and focus on the whole. So that might show up as an enterprise process map. That's not terribly sexy, but it's really <laughs> effective when you're yeah. saying, people, we need you to come out of your marketing silo and begin to think more collaboratively about how you partner in the field and in service of patients. And we want you to understand customer centricity. Whoa, how do I do that? <laughs> I don't even understand. Right, right. So these structures that are not, you know, they're not the buzzwords. You don't hear process map and agility in the same sentence very often. But for no. us, in our, in our framework, we're really recognizing that for people to adopt agile ways of working or increase their uh, experimentation and design thinking, that level of orientation to the current state and the desired future state needs to be there and it needs to be at the whole. And so this is one of the places that we see some organizations that have made the shift into agile falling short in giving folks the roadmap to mm -hmm. orient inside of that, that new shifting and complex landscape. I think that I, I love that. And, and, and sometimes we need these tools that, like you said, are not sexy, right? A process map. They're practical, they work. And there's something about, I love that you're using the word orienting, that we're orienting people to like, like how they fit in the hole, like you said, or how, what is the hole? How do they fit into it? And then it really is about orientation. Yeah. I and can't it's missed. Effectively, yeah. I can't effectively tell you how I'm going to better collaborate with marketing if I don't know how marketing works. I could give you my opinion, but it won't be grounded in reality. So right. how do I get myself sort of up to speed and oriented such that we can then co-create and imagine a new way of working? Mm, right. So that, that's part of what we're, what we're really investing in. The other piece that we're investing in with our clients is recognizing that as these new team structures form, whether they're forming around a challenge or they're forming around a particular project, uh, whether they're going to be together for a short period of time or a long period of time, these team formations need um, support to mm -hmm. stabilize and, and adopt new ways of working and recognize those old patterns. So we've been embedding coaches directly into those new teams as they form to provide both the capabilities transfer for new ways of working, as well as the structure to ensure that those become high-performing teams with more velocity. Mm -hmm, mm hmm That's a big very ad. smart. Yeah. Yeah. So those it's, are two, uh, two of the things that we're recognizing organizations that are really committing to transformation and uh, making it through the, the hairy portions of that change curve. 
um, are investing is that end-to-end -end visibility, of course, the design thinking and agility, but also that embedded coaching model. Right, the embedded coaching model, right? Understanding that when new teams are formed and there's new ways of working, right? It's not, it's rarely as easy as it looks, right, on paper. <laughs> Um, Absolutely. That it, you're asking people to have a different mindset, to probably change behavior. Um, you're, you're really often asking them to do something radically different than what they've done, and that, that's a challenge. And, and even when you start to see it showing up, it's tenuous. <laughs> I was, right. I right. was actually facilitating a workshop last week with our client, helping them adopt new ways of working, and the texts and the emails that I was getting from my team at the back office, at the home office, were um, approval seeking emails, right? Can I, am I allowed to, do you mind if, can I just send this note? I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> I have work to do to make sure my team feels empowered to execute inside of their scope and their remit. They know I trust them completely, that they have the freedom to execute. Um, mm -hmm. And it had been there and then, it, and then it went away, you know, a few days away from the office and people forget that I trust them completely and they can, they can execute effectively. That's so interesting, wow, right? Yeah. And did you end up having just curious a conversation with the team when you got back? No, today is my first day. So you're my oh, okay. first conversation. Oh, okay. Right. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so stay tuned. When I looked at what happened, there was a, um, there was a, there was a moment that had happened a few days before where there was a breakdown and I communicated, Hey, how did this happen? This is a breakdown. I want to understand more. And again, probably not being as aware of my positional power, the fact that I pointed out a breakdown maybe led people to think, oh, we shouldn't make mistakes. Like, let's, let's make sure we don't make that mistake again, right? And, and so that tension of creative autonomy and the flexibility to execute and the empowerment to execute with mm -hmm. learning and continuous learning, it's a nuance and it's a skill that we're building as an organization and the clients that we're serving are building as well. Yeah, absolutely. Do you find, you know, one of the things I coached for about 20 years. And one of the things I've often noticed when I coach is there'll be, I'll be like, not, this isn't always the case, but often there's this phenomenon I notice where I'll be just slightly, slightly ahead of a curve of what a client's learning. Right. So I know just enough oh, yeah. to be able to coach <laughs> them. Absolutely. I'm curious if you noticed that with your organization, with future state. Completely. Yeah. Actually, yeah. And, and it's really intentional. We actually talk yeah. about ourselves as a Petri dish for 21st right. century work, right? If we're not doing it here at Future State and grappling with it, how do we have any chance of supporting our, our organizations? Right now, Future State's really committing to anti-racism and doing our work inside of our organization to uh, ensure that we're creating an environment that is inclusive and equitable, mm -hmm. which means what's right up in front of us most of the time is all the ways that we're not, mm -hmm. and how, how we're committed but not clear exactly on what that's gonna take. And to your point, that's just, you know, we're about a half a second ahead of the team members that we're working with in large organizations that are also saying, hmm, beyond employee resource groups and, um, and you know, anti-bias training, what else is it gonna to take to really transform our organization? Mm, absolutely. And do you, you know, I'm, now, now that you brought that up, I'm really curious. Um, when you all, you know, you and your team, right, come together and you're talking about the future state of future state, mm -hmm. what, I mean, what is your vision? What is your dream? Um, well, and it shifts all the time, right? But I think the, the vision for future state is to enable extraordinary visions that positively impact the world. Over the course of the next 10 years, we want to have more and more of our projects be with clients who are serious in their commitment to positive impact for community, positive impact for the planet, positive impact for their employees, and positive financial impact. Um, so those triple or quadruple bottom line businesses should make up more and more of our portfolio as we continue to shift and grow and evolve. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of my secret dream, which I told our, our top biotech company client the other day is, I'd love to work with the first large biotech organization to become a certified B Corp. Mm. And I think it's, I think it's going to happen. We see Larry Fink um, in BlackRock, you know, recognizing that at triple bottom line really matters and um, it's beyond the bottom line for, for the folks that are going to be in our portfolio. We need to see that commitment. Um, so that's, that's the work that we are all passionate about. Most of the people who came to work at Future State, the fact that we're a B Corp is a big part of that for them and, and continuing to support 
the transformation of business period <laughs> into mm -hmm. a force for good on the planet. Um, it's a long journey. I'm probably not going to see it done in my lifetime, but uh, that, that more and more of our work is about businesses that are truly committed to having a positive impact in the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, I think it's that, that uh, you, you clear, it's clear your purpose, right? Your why is an organization. Um, yeah. I mean, you think yeah. business is the most powerful force on the planet mm -hmm. and um, like it or not, right? <laughs> whether, whether you feel it should be or it shouldn't be, it is. And how do we um, elevate the ability for leaders and CEOs and boards to, uh, to recognize that and, and make those choices? I think often about what it would be like to be the CEO of a publicly traded organization and not feel like you could do the work that you needed to do to make sure you were doing no harm because you were only being measured on your quarterly financial performance and how limiting that would be. I'm looking forward to the day when more and more CEOs are able to say, this matters, that we do this in a way that's sustainable for humans, sustainable for the planet, sustainable for communities. Definitely, definitely. And we move, yeah, and that's the primary, their primary reason for being, right? Mm -hmm. um, or one of the primary reasons, certainly, uh, yeah. absolutely. So, you know, I'm curious, we're going to take a quick break because I really want to dive into, you know, how do, what are steps to making outrageous futures a reality, right? So we're going to give listeners some steps, some concrete, uh, concrete things they can take away if, if they want to create their own, right? Their own outrageous future. Uh, so you are listening to The Brilliance Ultimatum. I'm Claudette Rowley, and we'll be right back. Is traditional medicine not working for you? Do you still feel as if your health isn't 100%? Here at the Holistic Medical Center, Dr. Nushin Darvish and the qualified staff look through the dimensions of wellness and start a healing plan prioritized to your needs. Our physicians assess the whole you until complete health is achieved. Get the help you need by visiting drdarvish.com or call 425-451-0404. Have you ever wondered what your pets think about? Do you know what your pets are saying to you? Dr. Monica will be your pet's translator to help you understand what your pets are trying to communicate to you. Enhance the bond with your furry friends on Pets Talk with Pet Communicator, Dr. Monica, each month on TransformationTalkRadio.com. For more information about Dr. Monica, visit PetCommunicator.com. Imagine starting your week off with a teaching, a clearing, and an activation direct from the God Consciousness. If you would like to feel more in charge of your week ahead, then I personally invite you to join me, Tracy L. Clark, for our monthly Soul Sunday non-denominational service at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, online or in person. All donations for this event go to the TLC Initiative Fund to help those in need. Sign up now at TracyLClark.com and let's connect together in the glory round. TransformationTalkRadio.com This is Claudette Rowley and we are back on the Brilliant Ultimatum. Time's up. And we're talking today with Shannon Atkins, who is the CEO of Future State. And Shannon, I am really intrigued by um, this idea of making outrageous futures a reality so when we talk about out or you talk about outrageous futures like what what should we envision <laughs> everybody's version of outrageous is just slightly different right <laughs> true true that's why it's intriguing <laughs> um, yeah i mean I, it, at one point in time in my organiz in my life it was you know there was a there was an idea that it was outrageous to think that my work that i got paid for and took care of my family could also take care of my commitment to community and social impact. I, re I remember thinking, oh, wouldn't it be cool to be one of those folks whose job is to do corporate giving for a large enterprise? That'd be such a cool job. You'd have a job that was also about purpose. Um, thankfully, I think that's shifting. So I think first and foremost, it's that personal purpose work. That every person taking a, a bit of time to invest in understanding what moves me, what matters to me, what am I best at, what am I passionate about? So coming back to our point of view as 
as a connected organization, we start with that purpose. I do think leaders need to be deeply connected to it personally. Um, and, but then you gotta bring your team along and let them co-create alongside you. So um, I actually just, we do purpose work with our clients all the time. Um, and a purpose that is you know, compelling and simple, plain language, something that people can rally behind is, is a critically important first step. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, you know, maybe this is my radical point of view, that's the most important step. So you'll lose sight of it. And we, mm. we at Future State, we use it, we bring our vision and our purpose forward in every single conversation we have as a team. So that's the very first two slides that we ever go through anytime we're talking to our team members, which does get old at times. But every time we're making decisions <laughs> about, you know, what are our priorities and strategies for the year? How much do we think we should be contributing to employee health plans? How much should we be doing in our community? Should we take on this client or not? Is this a pro bono opportunity we want to pursue? We're always bouncing decisions and, and possibilities against that against that future state. And then recognizing when it starts to feel like it's expired a bit. It's not, it's not calling you forth anymore and do go back and do that work again on reading that vision. I love that you say this, you know, this can be, this is considered by some people to be a radical idea, right? That your outrageous future, your purpose and your why and having that deep connection to it should drive, it sounds like, should drive every, all of your decisions, right? It's a place you need to go back to, right? And check in and see if you're aligned. Absolutely. Um, so yep. tell us, yeah, so why is that, why is that radical? Oh, I think, you know, it's radical for people who, my husband, um, I, he's wonderful and he's amazing. And he never had the message in his life growing up that work could be something that was meaningful and purposeful. It was just to complete the process of getting a paycheck. And I recognize the privilege that I have of being able to have a job that also fulfills me at a purpose level, at a heart level, at a meaning level. Um, and certainly across the globe, that's really a privilege. But if you do find yourself in that position, I think it's easier sometimes to go through what we've been told matters most in your work, which is, are you, um, are you getting promoted? Are you safe? Are you keeping people happy? Are you making your boss successful? <laughs> Did you make your customers successful? Did you make your clients successful? Are you bringing in the numbers? So as we um, emerge and look a little bit more like our millennial leaders who have said all along, it's important to me to be fulfilled. It's important for me to be learning and growing, and it's important for me to have a meaningful impact. Uh, th this is becoming a less radical idea, but certainly for me, it was quite radical. And for many folks, it's still quite radical. The very first CEO roundtable I was a part of, I shared my vision and my commitment to my team members uh, as employee owners and one of the other CEOs in the group said, man, if you were a CEO of one of the companies in my portfolio, I'd fire you. Wow. <laughs> wow. I think a lot of people think that's not the job of a CEO to pay attention to humans and to pay attention to the community and to pay attention. Mm. Wow. What a statement. It was. <laughs> I said, that's okay. I don't think I'd work for one of the companies in your portfolio. <laughs> so anyway, right. So we're all set. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So this, yeah, so the job of the CEO, right, to pay attention, like you said, to humans and community and purpose. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, and I, I completely agree with you, and it's something I talk about also, this idea that we mentioned before, um, a, a little while ago about, you know, business can change the world, right? Yeah. That when we, business has the power to do that, and it sounds like that very much connects into that. If we're looking differently at purpose, humans, right, connection, community, then that it causes us to make different decisions. Absolutely. And I think the, um, the conversation about the job of a CEO is interesting because I do spend some time with the B Corp community and with other social venture communities as well. And I, I think there's as much you know, faulty logic in the notion that many purpose-driven organizations have that profit is secondary to purpose. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, the, in, the innovative and creative and effective CEOs of the 21st century are not the CEOs that say, well, we have to sacrifice in order to take care of our team member. Mm -hmm. They are the CEOs that say, we are going to make our business so differentiated, so valuable, so competitively you know, distinctive that not only will we hit our profitability goals and margins that are commensurate with all those others in our industry, we'll do so in a way that is aligned to our values and our purpose. 
thinking Rothy's, thinking Eileen Fisher, you know, thinking so many brands today that we have to mm -hmm. look to that are certainly outperforming their peers, not just in environmental sustainability and people practices, but also in growth and in profitability and in uh, brand success. So certainly the idea that it's one or the other is, it's, it's a pretty um, immature idea at this point. I think there's a lot of evidence that you can do all three. You absolutely can do all three, right? And I think when, and I completely agree with you that if you say we're gonna sacrifice profit, right? For purpose to people, you're also, there's, there's a level I've noticed of um, integrity and precision, right? And quality that comes from saying in innovation, how do we honor people, purpose, and profit, right? Yeah. Is all equally important. It actually asks, it causes you to raise your game. Absolutely. It causes yeah. you to do something else completely versus, oh, well, we'll sacrifice profit. Oh, we'll sacrifice people. Mm -hmm. And no, 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 no. All is equally important. That's right. Yeah. That's your and, job. That's why you get yeah. paid the big bucks. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Figure it right. out. So, how do you ra how do you how do you raise this game and then in the process of raising it mm -hmm. so to speak it, everyone like you you've used the word rise up a couple times that were those words right and that it, i think it helps everybody grow as people right it raises everybody's self-awareness in the organization right. so right. there's something really exciting about it um what you know any other steps i think the other step you've is noticed to making outrageous futures a reality yeah, it, that organizations can take a look at I think the other step is building your capabilities related to innovation and, and creativity and unlocking that passion and creativity of your team. There's a lot of different resources in that. One that we know the data supports is diversity um, mm -hmm. and making sure that you're bringing folks in from all various points of life and, and experiences. And then you're creating an inclusive environment where those ideas can really flow um, effectively. And I think there's still a lot of work for us to do as organizations uh, to ensure that we're, we're doing that work well. Uh, but certainly I've found that the more that this purpose is owned by the collective and the more diverse the collective is, the better we are in terms of our ability to pursue that radical future um, with velocity. So th those, are, those are a few of the key pieces that, that we're really paying attention to is our own uh, inclusion and participation from all walks of life within our organization towards that future. So you've, you've used the phrase with velocity a couple of times, which mm -hmm. I love, which I love. And so when you talk about that, what do you mean from an organizational perspective? Um, I was thinking about this in terms of being patient with people and patient with, with process and patient with the moment, mm -hmm. but imp impatient for the outcome and the impact. Um, one of the clients that we're working with is, is up to something pretty extraordinary. They're up to transforming the healthcare ecosystem and reducing the cost of healthcare for all. Well, there's, mm, nice. like, I want that to happen fast, right? Yeah, I don't want, absolutely. I don't want that to take another 50 years. <laughs> right. And right. in the moment, we've got to be patient with folks learning new ways of working and developing new skills and, you know, trying new technologies. But we need to never say, well, you know, we'll get to that next week as it relates mm. to working mm -hmm. on that purpose and delivering on that impact. So that balance of, of experimentation, failure, learning, and growing, but that dogged pursuit of that of that outcome and of that purpose. I love that juxtaposition that you have you have patience in the moment, right? Like you said, people are experimenting, learning, failing, and learning, right? And going through that process, patience in the moment, while having that velocity, right? That velocity, excuse me, that impatience for the outcome, right? That urgency. Yeah to um, achieve that particular purpose. So I love that. And that is actually such a great note to wrap the show up on. <laughs> and I wanna thank you so much, Shannon, for being the guest today on The Brilliance Ultimatum um, and for sharing such great information, your perspectives, such you know, great insights about your company and your work. So thank you, and leadership, thank you so much. My pleasure. And, and wanna thank all the listeners for tuning in. As always, we had a great time. Um, please join us the second and fourth Friday of each month at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. And have a great couple of weeks, and we'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to the hit show, The Brilliance Ultimatum Times Up with Claudette Rowley. Tune in next time on TransformationTalkRadio.com for powerful conversations, practical innovations, and transformative solutions as Claudette and her guests delve into the possibilities and move beyond the mindset of division. Each show, Claudette strikes right at the heart of the matter and looks past political squabbles, lack of humanity, and what she calls reality resistance. 
We just need the will. For more information about the Brilliance Ultimatum, time's up. Visit culturalbrilliance.com and join the cultural revolution. See you next time. Views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio.